Welcome to Happened Here. People, places, and the stories they tell. I am Sharma Rahman, host of Episode 3, Artistic Covent Garden, Dance, Dracula, and Pride and Prejudice. In this episode, we will tell the stories of three artistic spirits, a woman with a dream about diversity and the colour of ballet, a novelist who seems to have given away his soul, and how Jane Austen may have been inspired to model a famously pure character on a woman with uh, rather looser morals. So, without further ado, let's begin. The Royal Opera House, Covent Garden. Black Swans. Written by V.L. Richardson, performed by Jasmine Elcock. April 2009. The nervous tension is palpable backstage. A packed auditorium is enjoying a glittering occasion at the Royal Opera House, one of the most revered performance spaces on earth. Ballet Black, the company founded by Casa Pancho, is about to take centre stage, aware that this is not your average audience. As the company gather their thoughts and go through their stretches, everyone knows they're about to dance into a global spotlight. London is playing host to the G20 summit where 20 of the planet's most powerful leaders gather to discuss the world economy. Tonight's event is to celebrate and entertain the spouses of these heads of state. And, judging by the number of news stories about her, one spouse is overwhelmingly the most famous, possibly more so than some of the political leaders themselves, Michelle Obama. Michelle has been vocal in her support of women, particularly women of colour, gaining the confidence to strike out and make their mark in the world. Casa Pancho's Ballet Black's performance will merit her special attention. Casa trained in ballet at the Royal Academy of Dance. Inspired by the Caribbean half of her mixed heritage, she chose black women working in ballet as the subject of her degree dissertation from Durham University. Casa expected black ballerinas to be rare, but was stunned to find none. Not one. When she questioned this, the answers she heard stunned her. Black dancers had flat feet. Their bottoms were too big. Their body shape was unsuitable for ballet. Black ballerinas in Swan Lake would look wrong. Casa could have become disheartened, but instead decided something had to change, and a year later in 2001, founded Ballet Black to provide dancers of black and Asian descent with inspiring opportunities in classical ballet. Not everyone was welcoming. Some initial reviews were condescending, dismissing Ballet Black as a hard-working heritage troupe. The very definition of damning with faint praise. Others talked of the company doing ballet their way, code for a less sophisticated version of real ballet. <laughs> Despite this, the company steadily gained respect. Confirmation of this came in 2003, when Deborah Bull, creative director of the contemporary arm of the Royal Opera House, invited the company to base itself in their Covent Garden complex. It was a significant moment. Casa would use this new base to transform the ripples they had been making into waves. Their first season at the ROH's Lindbury studio confirmed their growing status with glowing reviews. Ballet Black had arrived. For that heady night in 2009, Casa commissioned award-winning choreographer Will Tuckett to create a new piece. It did not disappoint. De Puymont, an intricate neoclassical piece, demanded the highest technical and artistic standards, later described as Sorbet Cool. It was a stellar success. That triumphant night saw a meeting of kindred spirits, Michelle Obama and Casa Pancho. Both are natural leaders, have vision, high standards and great people skills. Their purpose? To encourage people of colour to be successful, 
is positive and determined. Commissioning De Puymont for such a high-profile event encapsulates Casapancho's artistic approach, daring yet respectful of tradition. Ballet Black is now a well-renowned company famous for producing innovative and exciting work. They are indeed doing ballet their way. And it has earned Casa Pancho an MBE. To the late 19th century now, and a writer who drew inspiration from another theatre in Covent Garden. And what better place to imagine desperate happenings and dark worlds than in the strange atmosphere of an empty theatre? the unexplained flap of a stage curtain and the ill-lit labyrinths backstage. The Lyceum Theatre, Wellington Street, Covent Garden. Theatre of Blood, a Gothic Dream. Written by Becky Stamp, performed by Stephen Fry. Eighteen ninety. Winter. Night. A creature is forming in Bram Stoker's mind. He sits spellbound in the middle of the deserted balcony overhanging the stalls of the Lyceum Theatre, the space suspended now between the pumping blood and applause of the departed audience and the grave-like yawn of the empty stalls. He stares at the red curtains, black now in the gloom, a giant cloak rising to enfold the abandoned auditorium. His breath hangs in the air as a solitary candle by his side drips its way to darkness. Dimly aware of the clock chiming midnight, he notes the witching hour. Rousing from his reverie, he picks his way through dark theatre corridors to his small office, candle-throwing shadows that follow him down the walls, and not for the first time, Stoker can feel, deep in the pump of his heart, that first wrenching encounter with the man who employs him now as his business manager. Obsessed, drained, he slumps in his office chair and sleeps. Fourteen years ago, in Stoker's hometown of Dublin, Henry Irving, the greatest actor of his generation, strode into Stoker's life in somewhat human form. Stoker had watched mesmerised as the charismatic man recited an epic poem about a murderer. The horrid thing pursues my soul. It stands before me now. And he had burst into hysterical tears at the intensity of Irving's performance. Outwardly, Irving, Stoker's employer and by 1890 actor-manager of the Lyceum, was every bit the archetypal Victorian gentleman. A striking figure in a long black coat, Irving towered above most six foot two inches of presence, pale face framed by an upturned collar and curtained black hair. To scratch the surface, however, or to return that black gaze under those black eyebrows for a little too long, means to look right into the face of that thing that you feel hiding under your bed at night, to be tethered to that thing through your waking and dreaming hours, to see in those dark eyes the unblinking stare of the undead. Stoker watches himself rise from his chair and stagger to the washbasin in his office, like a corpse rising from the grave, and sees himself staring into the cracked mirror, but in the glass there is no answering reflection. Stoker wakes with a start from that haunted hour between sleep and the beginning of day, having spent the whole night again 
at the Lyceum in his office chair. Splashing water on his face, his heart feels swollen with life as it thumps its steady rhythm against the corset of his ribcage. He might as well have reached into himself and pulled it out red and bloody before plonking it down on the box office stand when he signed himself away as Irving's guardian of this place. Replaying the memories in his mind, this absorption of one man's life in another, Stoker lets out a gasp, pulls a battered notebook from his pocket, and puts shaky pen to paper. The dam, unstoppered, unstoppable, ideas flowing freely and inevitably as a rush of perinatal blood. I know what has happened to me here, he thinks, and the transformation is almost complete. I know what has been done to me. Vampire. Our third and final story in this episode takes us further back in time from Victorian vampires to Regency society and to a beloved author, another of the artistic souls, who drew inspiration from the theatres of Covent Garden, Jane Austen. The Austen, Maund and Tilson Bank at 10 Henrietta Street, Covent Garden. Jane Austen sees a portrait. Written by Sarah Fleming, performed by Kate Reed. Would you associate Jane Austen with the seamier side of Regency life and the art of spanking? We tend to think of her sitting primly, always near the top of the best ten writers of all time, writing satirically, wittily, about women's place in society. And her most popular novel? Pride and Prejudice. The novel focuses on the two eldest Bennet sisters, the sparkling, clever Elizabeth, who learns to love the irascible Mr Darcy, and the eldest, Jane, kind, innocent, and beautiful, who falls in love with and marries Mr Bingley. Recently, scholars believe they may have uncovered Austen's inspiration for Jane Bennett's looks. In January 1813, Pride and Prejudice is published to great acclaim. It's Austen's second novel, the first published only two years earlier when she was 36. Jane's career is finally taking off. In May that year, she stays with her eldest brother, Henry, in rooms above his bank at 10 Henrietta Street, Covent Garden. Although it's an unusual setting for a lady, not very genteel, bustling, a shopping street with a draper's just next door, a baker's and artist studios, Jane is loving her time there. One day, Jane and Henry go to an art exhibition in the Spring Gardens in St James's Park. There, Jane finds a portrait that looks just how she has always imagined Jane Bennett, later Mrs Bingley, to look. She writes to her sister Cassandra on the 24th of May. Mrs Bingley is exactly herself. Size, shaped face, features and sweetness. There never was a greater likeness. She is dressed in a white gown with green ornaments. Scholars believe that the painting she saw was Portrait of a Lady by Francois Huet Villiers. The painting itself is difficult to track down, but there is an etching copy of it made by the famous poet, painter and printmaker William Blake. It looks exactly as Jane Austen described it. The portrait is of one Georgina Quentin. Here's the thing. In 1811 when Austen was actually writing Pride and Prejudice, she had also then visited her brother in Covent Garden. And at that time, Georgina Quentin was also living in Henrietta Street with her uncle, a button maker. Had Jane and Georgina passed by in the street? Or even met back then? Had Georgina inspired the look for one of Austen's heroines? Maybe. 
There is a delicious plot twist, however. By 1813, Georgina's husband was abroad, fighting with the Duke of Wellington against Napoleon. Georgina had found a way to support herself during his absence. She'd become a specialised courtesan, and in that spring, she became a mistress of the Prince Regent, later King George IV. Prince George loved Austen's work, and bought possibly the very first copy of her first novel, Sense and Sensibility. Thereafter, he bought multiple copies of her works to have them at all his residences. So, after seeing the portrait, is Jane's comment in her letter to Cassandra a sisterly in-joke? Does Jane know that Georgina has a reputation for providing spanking services and think it funny to suggest that virginal Jane Bennett is modelled on a courtesan? Or maybe Jane knows that her most famous fan, the regent himself, is interested in Georgina and is gently mocking him. It is a truth universally acknowledged that we shall probably never know. We will indeed never know. So, Black Ballet, Count Dracula, Jane Austen and the Art of Spanking, maybe not often grouped together, but all linked in time by the streets, the stories and the theatres of Covent Garden. Happened here. People, places and the stories they tell. Hi, I'm Will and I'm a sound editor at Happened Here. One of the things I love about the edit is finding and sculpting the sound effects that help bring the stories to life. In this episode, we use the song Queen Mary's Lamentation with the Jane Austen story. We know she enjoyed the song and almost certainly played and sung it during her stay in Henrietta Street. Come and find out more about us and our stories at happenedhere.com. But for now, everybody involved in Happened Here, the writers, the hosts, the performers, Thanks you for listening. Do come again. We've got lots more stories to tell.